Okay, everybody, welcome to another Surf Safe Boot Camp. Um, I hope you've enjoyed the other uh, the videos, unless this is your first. So this is your boot camp training for those of you that are serious about taking and passing this Surf Safe Manager certification the first time around. Again, it's a 90 question exam. Multiple choice if you studied, multiple guess if you didn't. I'm helping it. I'm helping you to make it become a multiple choice exam. Um, in the previous series, if you're watching these in order, we had addressed um, the three hazards to food, biological, chemical, and physical. So I'm going to continue from there if you've been watching it um, in ascending order or chronologically based on the way the videos are, are numbered. If not, it doesn't matter. You can totally bounce around however you see fit that is to your comfort. So here we go. What I want to jump in to is this little area. You know what? When I studied for the Surf Safe Food Manager exam the first time years ago, I almost had a, uh, a, a panic attack when I, when I came across the, um, the part with the... Uh, oh, let me show it to you. You tell me if you... If you've already had, if you've been panic stricken, H A C C P, right? Hazard analysis. Oh, oh, oh. Let me not give it to you, right? So most people, you'll hear it, you'll hear it mentioned, you'll hear it as a word, HACCP, right? Now here's what's cool. In case you didn't realize it, it's that it's actually two separate components, right? So I'm going to write it, again, I'm going to write it this way so that it's easier to share the information and I'll create a little bit of a gap so that you can see where that is. So HA, I'm intentionally going to use red. And the reason I'm going to use red is because we are identifying hazards, right? So it's hazard analysis, right? So first we are um, identifying right, hazards. Are we identifying chicken at this point? Do we have to identify that chicken is a big uh, risk factor for salmonella? Right? No, we know poultry must be well done, right? So that's not a hazard analysis anymore. So in a situation with poultry, poultry is actually already at this stage of the game. Poultry, now we're at, uh, oops, I'm sorry. I jumped a word ahead on my brain and my hand didn't keep up with me. Poultry, really, we're already looking at it at a critical control point, right? We already know poultry is a big carrier of salmonella to the tune of more or less, right? To the tune of 30%. We also already know that in order to reduce or eliminate salmonella or the pathogens in chicken, we need to cook it at 165 degrees, right? Fahrenheit. 17 seconds and if you remember once upon a time it was 15 seconds if you've been around in the industry long enough so now this 165 for 17 represents our critical control point right so that is how this would work out for you 17 seconds right so just to help you understand where you're working on hazard analysis critical control point. So then your question is, well, okay, so then what's the use of hazard analysis if we know about chicken? Okay, so now let's start looking at some hazard analysis, right? Now let's start identifying. A hazard analysis example could very well be that the restaurant has a new microwave, right? 
or a new dishwashing machine. Right? A new stove, a new oven. You get the picture? A new whatever. So the hazard analysis is that all that equipment is new and our employees may not know how to use it. So our critical control point in this scenario would be in the area of training, right? So you, you get the picture? The other thing is, let's look, at, let's look at another hazard analysis. Another hazard analysis, keeping new, is maybe a new employee, right? So what is the critical control point for that employee? Teaching them hygiene, hand washing, food storage, some of the basic things, right? One of my students just got a job um, in Connecticut. He moved there three years ago, and he's working as a dishwasher. So he has a lot of critical control point issues that need to be worked out by the employer because he is a new employee. He is the hazard, right? My, my student is a little walking hazard, right? Because he has to know how to wash those dishes. Remember, there's three steps to dishwashing, wash, rinse, sanitizing. Actually, just the three compartment sink. There are five steps to dishwashing. Scrape, wash, rinse, sanitize, air dry. So my, my student, my, my now graduate, needs to know how to wash dishes. So hazard analysis, a quick definition, of HACCP is to reduce or eliminate biological, doesn't fit, ah, oh, you know it's going to kill me, right, because I've already told you that I'm a little OCD, to reduce or eliminate biological, uh, chemical and or physical physical what hazards to reduce or eliminate biological chemical or physical hazards to safe levels right to reduce or eliminate right and we can add to safe levels why not right that's the definition. Now, if you go through the book that I used to study, the original, the, the SurfSafe book that is jam-packed with information, there must have been, back in the day, probably eight, eight or so pages worth of information on HACCP. And I thought they were going to literally throw the book at me, right? So, this is, in a nutshell, as I've been in the industry for as long as I've been in the industry, this is the most compact way to remember HACCP, H-A-C-C-P. Great history about HACCP and how um, it was developed for NASA, N-A-S-A, -A, NASA, the, uh, the space agency. I won't get into that, but it, it's got a rich history. You'd love it. If you, uh, if you love to do some research, by all means, look up HACCP and look up NASA, N-A-S-A. -A. You're going to find some very cool information. Okay, um, I'm going to redraw something I had drawn some time ago. Don't recall when it was, but since you've been watching all the videos and you're so diligent with your work, you already know what this is, right? And if you just joined us for the first time, I'll tell you that it is a three compartment sink, right? And if you remember, a three compartment sink has five steps, right? We're not going to go into this, it's on another video, but that's a three compartment sink. What I do want to remind you of is the first sink is called what? Wash, then you've got rinse, and then you've got sanitize. Oh, okay, I'll give you the first two steps too, right? Um, scrape and air dry, right? So, this is what your three compartment sink reflects, right? 
but then this stuff is your five step dishwashing process okay so I'm back here right and we said 110 degrees Fahrenheit on the first one 171 degrees if you're gonna hot water sanitize right air dry scrape etc okay now then here's where I was going with this let's make believe that I'm not gonna use water temperatures to wash or rinse but I'm actually going to use chemicals right so what do I do what is the word if I want to know that I have enough chemical in my sinks I'm testing for what I want to know that I have enough chemical in the sinks so I'm going to test uh, the ppm right if I'm going to if I want to make sure that the ppm is right what is ppm ppm is short for parts per million right that's what ppm is but how do I make sure that my ppm or my concentration is correct so what do I do I need to use I need to use what they're going to recall recall um, a chemical or a test kit Okay, so you're going to use, let me see if I can use a different color, right? So to test all this, I'm going to use a chemical, chemical, oh man, this is awful, chemical slash test kit, right? Because I'm going to test for I want to make sure that the concentration is right. So what does a test kit look like if you've never been in the industry? It's a little, looks like a little medicine tube and it's got little sticks in it. So you take the little stick, you dip it in the appropriate sink based on that chemical and, there, and it, it, it has little colors, right? I'm not going to draw it to scale, I'm going to draw it a little larger, but the test kit is something like this and it's got different shades of colors inside of that. So it tells you if it's too high, too low, or just right. Right? So depending on the test kit, your strip, those little strips, you then hold it up to the bottle and it shows you if your PPM or your concentration is correct for your for your for the chemicals that you're using as part of the dishwashing process. The other thing that you want to remember with respect to the test kit and the concentration is that it also matters in this place, right? It matters here too, right? Um, what are they called? Um, sanitizer bucket. Sanitizer bucket, right? So when I used to work at a restaurant way back in the day, um, I would we we didn't we didn't have training, man. You just kind of went to work. And you did what you had to do. So we would stick the um, the rag in our in our apron pocket, or we were so cool we throw it over our our shoulder and take care of our tables, right? But all these rags need to go back in the sanitizer bucket. Now some health departments um, require that those buckets be labeled, and actually part of the the code also requires that you label your bucket. But you also want to make sure that your concentration for sanitizer concent oh my goodness concentration you're going to need here you're going to need to use your test kit also right because it will wear out over time so you can add more more chemical or change the um, change the liquid now if you remember. We talked about hot water sanitizing, right? So we can do hot water sanitizing, right? And what was the temperature for hot water sanitizing? Assuming I fill up a little bottle, a little bottle. That's not too bad, you know what? 
It's got a little handle on it. It's not that bad. So anyway, if I'm going to use a um, hot water sanitizing, because I can do hot water sanitizing or chemical sanitizing, what was the temperature in there? Do you remember? Okay, perfect. Yes, 171 degrees Fahrenheit, right? So you can do hot water sanitizing. So that is that little tidbit on the test strips, concentrations, and PPM parts per million. All right, we are moving along. We are up to, okay, we covered it. I'll talk about it. Um, we talked about this already once. <clears throat> chemical storage, right? So chemicals um, should be stored away from food, right? So let's say I have done trainings at restaurants that are old. I've done health inspections on their behalf because they keep filling uh, their inspections. And I'll show you those pictures on one of these modules. But let's say I just, I'm an old little restaurant. I don't have the kind of room to, um, to, to store stuff in other places. Um, technically, chemical storage should be in another, in another room. All the containers for your chemicals need to be clearly labeled. If you drop the bottle or you got a, a value jug at one of the, those mega warehouses, right, and you want to pour it into smaller containers, use the common name. So label um, chemical container with common name. With the common name. What am I saying by that? What I mean by that is if, if the product is called, if it's called, if it's Clorox, just call it Clorox. That's the common name for that, that cleaner. And I can go on with a list of products, but you get the gist of it. You want to use the common name. Now, let, let's go back to that little restaurant that I was telling you out of Miami, right? Very limited storage. Um, they, they had to co-mingle their, their chemicals, which you're not supposed to do. But God forbid you have to, you want your chemicals to sit all the way at the bottom. You don't want to co-mingle, right? I'm, I'm sharing that with you right now. But what you definitely don't want your, your hazard analysis, your new employee, is putting chemicals up here and then storing food under here. Right, because you have a cross-contamination hazard coming down. Whereas, if your chemical is already here, right, again, you're not supposed to, but it's, it's a heck of a big challenge to contaminate upwards, right? Um, so be mindful of situations like that. Right, chemical storage under lock and key, put it away somewhere else, and Common names. Now, with respect to chemical storage, can I use a chemical container? Can I use a chemical container? Can I use it? Can I use it for food? Right? Can I use a chemical container for food? And the answer is no. Right? Just, no, you cannot use a, an old chemical container for food. Can I use a food container for chemical? Right? Can I use an old food container for chemical? The answer is yes, but. Right? So the answer is yes. But, and you guessed it, make sure there is no trace of any label. I don't recommend it because the, 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 um, the possibility of making a mistake is still is pretty high. Um, there is a situation right now with a, um, a chemical that has a very fruity aroma. I won't give you the name. You can look it up. But it has a fruity aroma. The bottle has a lot of fruits and things like that. It, it looks like juice, right? Um, problem with it is, and it even smells like grape and oranges and, and citrusy, 
problem that is happening is that the elderly folks, the senior citizens, um, they don't even have taste and, you know, have problems with their taste buds and their eyesight and they're consuming these bottles and, and, and they're trying to get these companies to stop disguising um, these chemicals in such pretty bottles because we have a huge population of senior citizens here in Florida and we have had cases where these folks are going to the emergency room and because they ingested a chemical. So can I use a food container for chemical? Yes, but, but I don't recommend it, right? But can you? Yes, right? But you cannot use the chemical container for, um, for food. Same with boxes, by the way. So I went to a Chinese restaurant once upon a time. You'll find that a lot of my stories are Chinese restaurants once upon a time. Love Chinese food. But I ordered four lunch specials. And I was so happy when I got that box. Right? So they put the four orders in that box. Take it home, unload it. Everybody eats. I put the, 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 tr the food in the refrigerator, the leftovers. And I left the box on top of my counter. What I didn't realize in the excitement of having gotten a box, <laughs> I was so hungry, was that on the box, um, the next morning, I realized that it read eggs, right? That's a no-no. You cannot reuse a, 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 a box that was used for eggs, fish, meat, poultry, Nothing. If it, if it was previously used for anything, poultry, meat, fish, you name it, just go on. That box needs to go into the, into the trash. Get rid of those boxes. Okay? If, if, you, if you're so busy, if you're doing so great that people are ordering um, massive amounts of food to go, spend the money on the difference. Get those boxes. But they have to be clean because um, there's a local supermarket chain in Florida, a very large supermarket chain. Again, I don't like to give out names because it makes it sound like the supermarket chain was at fault. But they were encouraging reusable, they were encouraging reusable bags, right? So the little handles, and they were great. Go green, everybody. Go green or go home, right? So what happened was um, several Girl Scouts got salmonella poisoning from cookies, right? So people were baffled. How did Girl Scouts end up with salmonella poisoning selling Girl Scout cookies? It didn't make sense. So it turns out that those reusable bags were not being washed or sanitized or rinsed or anything. They were just going from the grocery store, they put their Girl Scout cookies in there, selling them, their hands were touching them. Whoever was buying the cookies, were touch they were touching the cookie boxes also. So then all of a sudden you saw a spike in salmonella cookies, uh, uh, I'm sorry, in salmonella, from salmonella, due to, um, oh my God, Girl Scout cookies. Girl Scout cookies. I'm saying one thing, writing another. My brain is misfiring, but yeah. So that's what happened. So containers should, should not have been previously used for food products. They should have been new, specifically for those for that transfer. Alrighty. Uh, mm, 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 mm. Okay, great. Oh, um, I'm going to go into one other thing here. Um, have you ever, well... Pre-COVID-19, have you ever been to a, to a buffet, right? So whether you went to a buffet, hot and cold, right? And we talked about this from children's menu, right? So, but you'll find it in buffets, specifically um, sushi, right? Sushi or even actually raw meats, um, what is it when you have food at the table and they, they come and cook it? Like Benny Hanna's, um, they cook it at the table. You know what I'm talking about. I wish I could hear you. 
Um, but they prepare the food at the table, and the name has completely uh, slipped my mind. It'll come back to me. But think of Benihana. Um, they cook the food at the table. Ah, oh, it's killing me. Anyway, so all of these things need what is referred to as a uh, consumer advisory. Right? So what does that mean? That at the bottom of every single page of your menu, you need a consumer advisory down there that reads something along the lines of reading, of eating, uh, it reads, eating raw or undercooked foods may cause severe illness or death. Da, 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 people with. So that is what your consumer advisory goes down there. If you've got buffet bars, it'll be somewhere on the glass, somewhere near the plate, somewhere behind the, the, um, the cook. Um, oh my gosh, I can't remember the name of that. Anyway, so that's where you find consumer advisories. Remember, with children's menus, um, with, I'm sorry, children's food, all food must be well done. You cannot serve raw or undercooked anything in a children's menu. But consumer advisory is what we're referring to here. One of my favorite uh, restaurants in the neighborhood right here, a Thai restaurant, um, the health department, after years, the health department finally realized that they didn't have a consumer advisory for their, for their foods in the, uh, in the menu. So they had to get new menus. All right? So ladies and gentlemen, that's it. That's where we are now. Thank you for tuning in. If, again, if you need that e-study guide, you haven't gotten it yet, please give me, uh, shoot me an email. If you haven't put it in your hands yet, I would love for you to have it. Gerson.puig at gmail.com. Okay, um, that is all the time we have. Thank you so much for tuning in. Tune in for the next boot camp. I hope these uh, trainings are working out for you and that you're learning something new. I'm open to suggestions. You can, you can also shoot suggestions there uh, and, and share it with me. Also for anything else you want, whatever you need. I'm here. I'm available. I'm home. I'm quarantined. Be good. Love you. Bye.